Right, so I'll start off with some caveats. First, uh, energy is an incredibly complicated uh, subject. There's no way I can cover basically what are an infinite number of combinations that you can use to get at it. And I'm trying to you know, pull back and have a very broad overview to sort of basically get an order of magnitude understanding of the challenge that's in front of us. And my focus on innovations, which will come at the end, is going to be on nuclear energy, not just because I'm the, the Department of Nuclear Engineering, but it's mostly because I'm, it's what I'm familiar with. But a basic message of this is that innovation in low carbon energy is actually required basically across the board. So what's the scale of a low carbon energy challenge? So basically, what we have are two challenges in front of us. One of them is that basically in the mid 80% is where we now get all of our energy is from carbon-based energy. And on the left-hand side, you see is that it's also not just in one usage. It's not just electricity. It's not just transportation. It's broadly distributed across a wide range of usages. So I'm going to even pull back even from that kind of scale and just say, what is the power demands of our nation and world? If we think in sort of on a scale of 20 to 30 years, with a two-fold improvement in efficiency, you're basically looking at something like two and a half terawatts for the United States of power, which is needed. And so a terawatt, by the way, is a million, million watts. It's a lot of power, because um, there's a lot of people. And globally, it's a nice even number. It's actually about 10 terawatts. So the good news. There's more than 10 terawatts of low car carbon power in the world. So if you look at this example, for instance, on the top left-hand panel, if you blot out these parts of the planet, and this is sort of showing solar radiation intensities, if you blot out those with solar, that actually provides 10, 10 to 20 terawatts of power. Now those are fairly large, that's probably the size of Arizona, the one in the upper left-hand corner, and you actually can calculate that there could be even possibly up to even an order of magnitude higher than that, deployable. The same with wind, there's more than 10 terawatts of that deployable, and if you look in fact at not a renewable, in fact a fuel-driven one such as fission, you have more than 4,000 years of the present uh, known reserves of uranium in seawater and are very inefficient to actually use of uranium in our present light water fleet. So there's lots of power around in the world that's not carbon. The challenge is simple but big. It's uprooting 83% of our present energy source and move it towards a low carbon energy. And energy is a particular, and I say uproot, because energy is at the root of our economic and therefore our, basically our standard of living. So this is not, this is, and so, so my, 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 my kids can't imagine a life without the internet. But society thrived and lived without the internet. But it didn't do it without energy consumption. So what are we looking at? We need to have, the challenges are to the deployment rate. Can we change over fast enough? And after this morning, I think I want to accelerate it even more. Um, the reliability, you have to think about, this one of them is intermittent re renewable energy sources. The diversity of the usage which means both the distribution and the transportation of energy, and in the end, economics. I'm not an economist, but you also understand that will the low carbon energy future not occur because it's too expensive, which is sometimes an economic argument, or will it actually uproot our basic economic model, and therefore that's going to be also highly perturbative to our society. So I'll actually talk about deployment rate. So let me start with a straw man low carbon energy mix that basically meets that 10 terawatts of power requirement. So what I've done is actually combined basically intermittent sources here, and I've sort of put that at about 20% because there's some analysis that says that's a pretty good level to have it at for stability purposes. And the rest of it is continuous, and the big players there are basically hydro and nuclear energy. So you can see, you can see the mix of which I've done here, 20% I've distributed this across, and in fact what I've done particularly for hydro, for the standard renewables, I've actually, in some sense, maxed them out both based on reliability and also basically known uh, reserves of that. So that gets you to there, you basically would have half in nuclear, which actually doesn't vary much, in fact, from the scenarios that you saw this morning. Um, so where does this go? So this is where the, your, eye open, your eyes open, is that now you take a look at what we have installed right now, and you look at that low carbon energy future. And if you look at the required scaling from what we have today, it spans from an order of magnitude upscale up with respect to nuclear energy, all the way up to three orders of magnitude with solar power. And those are different kinds of solar power, solar PV and concentrated solar. So what this means is that the scaling factor that we have from now to there essentially guarantees significant risk for all low carbon energy. And that means we have to have risk dispersal and why a multi-pronged approach is really needed. So risk varies, but is linked primarily to the environmental footprint, 
our sort of ideas of energy and national security and economics. So I just want to touch on those uh, briefly. So one of the largest risks is actually how fast the low carbon energy sources can be deployed because we don't have an, an infinite amount of time. And it's, again, sobering number to just look at the number of units that we're talking about. These are large-scale units of wind turbines, concentrated solar power plants, uh, hydroelectric dams, nuclear power plants. You're talking about implementations and deployments which are in the thousands to millions. And I'll just point out is that whenever you scale something by this factor, this means that present uncertainties and present inefficiencies amplify themselves enormous amounts when you go to this level. So the good news here is that actually I'll point out one of them is that, so how fast can you bring low carbon energy sources to bear? So nuclear energy is an interesting one in terms of the historic lesson that it provides. So this is a plot that actually shows the fraction of a nuclear of energy, of electricity produced by uh, nuclear energy, by our standard light water fission power plants. And I'll point out the beginning of this graph is just before 1960. It was the first ever watt of power ever put on to a commercial grid. And yet, in the span of just, under, just over a decade, it was actually already providing more than 10%, and then actually ramped up to something like almost 20%. This should give, not, not that this is a, uh, a sell job for nuclear energy, but it's just gives, it, it hardens you to understand that you can deploy low carbon energy actually at a fast rate into a real economic system. Okay, so that's the good news. The caution is that the deployments rate will vary, and this comes to the complicated economic societal mix that with, with all of these. And what I'm showing here, that was just the United States. This is actually the ramp rate, and that the top blue line is sort of some in, ra average indicator of the per capita electricity consumption. This is just electricity. And you can see that over the span of around a decade, we actually have several examples from many countries, mostly in Europe, actually France, Belgium, and Sweden, that actually more or less made their electricity sector almost all nuclear energy. I'll point out is that in terms of renewables, wind and solar in Germany, which has a very uh, extensive program to do that, actually ramped up in an absolute rate in terms of the percentage applied per person at a slower rate. And in fact, if I looked at, it was, I actually came up with that ratio in that table before intentionally, is that the deployment rate being sort of four times about less in terms of renewable than, than nuclear was about roughly consistent, in fact, with what I deployed before in my straw man model. So you have to be cautious in this because you realize we don't have an infinite amount of time, and so you have to sort of look at historic data and on future scalings about how you actually might get this energy on the grid. So the deployment challenge is complicated because it involves the complex things of how much land and water you use, regulatory issues, aesthetics, uh, safety. Uh, and this is just a chart which shows you, you know, these things take up space on the planet and you have to be concerned about just that. So this is a nuclear power plant, uh, a wind farm, and solar energy uh, plant. These take up large amounts. They have very different power densities. This is one of the reasons why nuclear energy is actually quite attractive is because of its high power density. It seems to be rather quickly de de um, deployable, but we know that there's a complex set of risks and, and the things that you have to look at. So I'll get to safety, and this is an interesting one, because the good news is that if we switch over to low carbon energy, this is actually the thing that has an immediate impact, in fact, on human health that we can measure right now. And if you look at what we're using right now, just based on the number of mortalities per normalized per unit energy uh, produced in the different energy sources, what we're using right now is actually the most deadly to us. And all of the, all of the, all the low carbon energy sources over here are actually the lowest. So that's actually very good news because I think that that's another thing that actually compels us to think about the immediate effects. Although again, after this morning, I think the immediate effects of climate change are a little bit more apparent to me. The other challenge about large scale deployment is actually not jeopardizing the economic engine that has energy at its roots. So this is actually in the last talk as well too, but I've simplified it. This is so-called energy intensity. Namely, how many, mega, how, many, how many units of energy do you actually need to use to in fact produce, um, sorry, uh, sorry, sorry, to produce a, a dollar of GDP? And so that's actually a fairly constant number across the indu industrialized country, and I've sort of done the math. And you can multiply this by the amount of uh, money that it costs you to generate a, a unit of energy. 
So I've, I'm Canadian originally, so I've picked Ontario uh, auditors report for electricity costs. And so what this is, they had a quite, uh, they actually had a very um, uh, ambitious program to deploy, uh, to deploy solar energy. And this actually showed up in the auditor's report for 2014. And what you're looking at was basically the cost of the dollars per megawatt. So if you take this cost and then multiply it by this energy intensity, this gives you an idea of what I would call the energy recycling factor. Namely, it's how much you're churning back into the system to produce the energy that keeps the economic engine rolling, okay? And I'll just point out, the current US factor for all energy is about 8%. That's fantastic, by the way. That basically means our energy multiplier is 12. Okay, that's the amplifier that we get into the economy. You'll notice the, va the vast variety uh, of, not, as in, but hydro and nuclear sort of being in this range, gas and oil, because there isn't gas and oil in Ontario, and wind it was sort of in the immediate range, and in fact, solar reached over 100%. Now, I don't mean to pick on solar here, but as my University of Toronto uh, colleague said, did any of these people live in Ontario? Um, uh, and, and this just means is that because the recycling factor will vary widely with, geogra with geography and also with your, your end usage. So this is another reason actually why diversity of approaches is critical to success, because you can't gamble the entire economy of going forward actually with a, probably with a single energy source actually uh, sc scoped out later on. So the good news is that the physics, or the science of it, because I'm a physicist in the end, is that a low carbon energy world is absolutely possible, okay? The strategy, though, means that you have to disperse and reduce risk through broad innovation R&D approach. So they say all known carbon energy sources require an over an order magnitude scaling. So this means we have to, we have to uh, decrease the risk across all of those low carbon energy technologies, whichever one is your favorite. You, you have to start lowering the risk. Um, this means you also have to start thinking about between intermittent and continuous sources. Hydro is just naturally limited. Nuclear seems to be the other option on the table. It's just from the numbers. And it's the other presently viable continuous source. I would note that if you can vastly improve energy storage or carbon capture, then that could actually change the balance. But you can't bet on that yet. And we must develop in context of a, of a complex economic and societal demands. So I'll just actually make a little, uh, a little advertisement here. This is exactly what MIT is doing, actually. This is the low carbon energy centers that are now being started as part of the Climate Action Plan, plan of MIT, fund, uh, 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 which is organized through the MIT Energy Initiative. And you'll notice the, the, the features on that talk about, go to basically looking at innovations in all those areas that I talked about. And the, in fact, I, I realized that I had them as separate as separate, they're not really separate. I consider these all coupled to one another, all feeding into an understanding of what this would look like. So now I'll just get to a few innovations, and I said I, said I apologize, these are in the nuclear area, but just to point out in just a few, a few of the a subset of these, there's some really interesting innovations. There are technologies which actually allow us to extrapolate with greater, uh, with greater optimism. So one of these, for instance, is just in deployment and safety. So this is the idea, this in fact was on the front page of the Boston Globe the other day, it's a floating offshore nuclear power plant. So the idea is try to address the, the problem, the couple of problems of reliability and economics by modularizing and centralizing basically the, uh, the, the construction of nuclear power plants uh, in a centralized factory, much like we do for a nuclear navy right now. Then the other part of it is you transport the energy to the places that you need it, which is basically along shorelines. Uh, also, we can also look at advanced nuclear technology, for instance, high temperature molten salt reactors, which have an very enhanced and very, uh, very good passive safety features, and you actually start combining these with very innovative advanced uh, uh, thermal cycles, such as the, the, the air Brayton combined cycle. Just what this ends up being is a way to look at both ec safety and economics coupled together in advanced nuclear, and in fact, you start looking at large range a large um, um, uh, energy storage in heat, and high quality heat, which then also allows you to respond to basically peak, uh, peak electricity demands when, the, when, when this varies from day to day and throughout the year. And finally, advanced materials are also important in this because a very interesting one is what you do about fuel and transportation. 
And, there's some, and we have this huge infrastructure that actually uses fuel and distributes it around. So if we could actually think, and this actually will probably come through materials innovations, you use centralized energy sources like solar and nuclear, you actually extract CO2 out of the atmosphere, out of the water, and you actually produce synthetic fuels, this actually quickly becomes then a net zero carbon system. And you might as well go for the home run, which is I, I have to, because I'm a fusion guy, so the, the, one of the home runs is fusion, because fusion actually is another, it actually has essentially an infinite uh, energy source. But we also know that we're actually on a pathway right now which I consider is too slow. So in fact, there's a set of innovations which we're, we're looking at actually right now at the Plasma Science Infusion Center. And also people out in the uh, private sector are starting to look at some of these, basically about getting fusion faster and sooner. So I'll just, I'll come back to that summary slide and I'll conclude there. Thank you. Thank you very much. Questions? Yeah, so they're very good questions, right? So this is very, there's a whole range, there's a whole, sorry, a field of study that actually that looks at these. So I'll actually get to the first one. So actually the biggest heat source that we know of is actually the Earth, it's geothermal. The limitations right now are economic accessibility, in fact, to, to the energy. Uh, so I'll just, I'll give a little plug. One of the most interesting set of work going on now is we're actually taking technology, which was innovations that were done in fusion energy, which say, what does this have to do? It turns out we're developing microwave drilling techniques that could actually drill down to possibly to 20 kilometers. If you could do that, this is actually a game changer for economic viability for, 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 for geothermal. To the, to the other one, there's a wide range of ones which, which go in this. You can make it more stable by having a better distributed grid. You notice what we maybe did. Grids is one of the ones which is up there, absolutely necessary. So those innovations will allow you to bring intermittent sources up and down by a small amount. And again, though, to the, those are important. All, in, all those innovations are important, but it doesn't change the big picture. We have order of magnitude challenges in front of us. <laughs> the plot that you showed uh, to express the danger associated with different energy sources um, that like wind and solar and some of those came in quite a bit above nuclear which mm -hmm. a lot of people have anxieties about mm -hmm. what is the is there a primary source of those fatalities in, in which ones Solar, wind, and the solar, solar, and the solar and wind. I mean, so these come in both the construction. So, for instance, in, oh, sorry, the question was, what is the source of the mortalities? Actually, I, I, I'm not sure. Actually, in those, ones. I know. So, I, I'll, I'll, I'll defer on that question about wind and solar. My suspicion is that it probably has to do with the construction of those, because that's, for instance, in coal, that actually includes, for instance, coal mining accidents as well, too. So it tries to entail mortalities of, of from front end to back end uh, on the energy sources. But that's a good question. I'm actually not sure of the details of, of the answer to that. Harry made that point, I think. Okay, there we go. It's, uh, Okay, so Carrie says it's people, it's, it's, it's like last winter in Boston, it's people falling off roofs, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And they're all, but the idea is the most important thing. They're all tiny numbers compared to other risks, yes. major policy change in energy management in the U.S. would you recommend? Ooh, that's a, that's a, that's a big one. Yeah. Obviously, um, policy is driving many of the energy decisions uh, from distribution to technology of generating. It, and we've been asked by virtue of our presence here, to accelerate the things we're thinking about and doing. 
Well, that's a wonderful, nice technological discussion, <laughs> but it won't get past policy. So yeah. from that standpoint, where's that? what's the single biggest hurdle in your opinion? So probably the biggest bottleneck for nuclear energy. The, the, the question is where, what would you, um, what would be the single thing that you would change policy-wise with respect to ex the acceleration or the deployment? Um, probably with respect to standard fission, uh, I'm sorry, with respect to fission power and advanced nuclear power, it, it's, it's the regulatory cycle. It's, it's simply too slow. We actually don't have, in fact, a regulatory um, a system that is actually ready to, in fact, uh, ex assess and deploy, because th those are necessary parts of it, which we completely agree, but we actually don't have the system in place. That's what I would do. I, right now, it's, uh, it's w well past a decade, okay, to do this. That's simply not fast enough. That, that would be the single thing that I would change. Yeah. 